Okay, folks, it's five past, so I guess we better um, start the proceedings for this morning. Welcome all. Thank you very much for coming. Um, th this morning we have, um, Giles has very kindly agreed to do us an introduction to pond plants, um, which is I'm really looking forward to. I am recording it um, uh, with Giles' permit. Giles is going to have a look at it afterwards, make sure he's happy with it. And if, it, if it's happy, we will put the, uh, the whole thing up onto the uh, the uh, the website later on and then after that I've got a little um a little film that um Sarah and Rose has put together uh, it's about two minutes long and it's a it's a sort of it tells the story of our um our survey training day at Mockers Park so it's quite a nice little thing and then um we've got a few bits of news for you which will tell you about some some updates about um about getting out into the wilds again so, um, Giles, if you'd like to start now. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So, <clears throat> it's yeah, just a bit of a general talk, really, on pond plants. So, I'm not quite sure how it'll turn out. Um, <clears throat> so, and I'll throw in a few of the ponds as well. So, this, this is one of the ponds up near Staunton on Arrow. So, um, one of the things I quite like about the Ice Age ponds is the way they really seem to sit very nicely in the landscape. Uh, they seem sort of very, well, they just look as if they've always been there, which really is what they have. So <clears throat> I'm not going to talk in detail about this one. <clears throat> and this, this is the pond we looked at a couple of years ago over near Norton Cannon. And I put it in because it really illustrates the effect of fencing a pond. Well, it's sort of two extremes of the ponds you get in Herefordshire, where either they tend to be very heavily grazed or they tend to be fenced off and not grazed at all and you can really see the difference um, in the vegetation and that when they're fenced and ungrazed they tend to get very heavily shaded by willows and other trees willows especially so and that really then has quite a big effect on the overall diversity of a pond so yeah, slight digression from plants but i mean when we sur survey this plant uh, pond for amphibians and invertebrates pretty much all we found was in the the open un, the open grazed area there was very very little in the shaded part <clears throat> and this is actually this done this is just down the road from the previous pond it's actually it's quite a nice site because it was a grazed site but not heavily grazed so it's somewhat on the undergrazed side so you, it's got a much... engaging. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Can somebody please something then? Um, the. It's not good to be coming, what was I saying? Uh, the yeah, so you, you can see you've got quite a nice vegetation sort of zonation here around the pond from the dry land in the front. You've first got this ring of uh, soft rush all the way around the pond. And then the lighter green plants within that, you can see you've got um, this bladder sedge. So like it's slightly wetter. And then you can't really see within that, you've got a, also a ring of float grass and then open water on the inside. So quite distinct vegetation zonation there. And then this is Mockers Park, probably one of the most famous ponds in the county. The, the lawn pool so this quite a nice area with very sort of diverse range of vegetation structure here with a lot of this grass going into the water and I included this one partly because it was the habitat for one of the white rare beetles this is the only part um, well only place in the county where it occurs and mainly actually in this part of the pond as far as I know but it isn't a beetle talk <clears throat> But I borrowed one of Will's photos for this this one. This is the bladderwort. Again, this is the only place in Herefordshire this occurs is at Mockers Park in the Lawn Pool. So <clears throat> it's a submerged aquatic plant, but it flowers most years above the water like this. And the <clears throat> this is the submerged part of the plant so it's a carnivorous plant and it's covered in these tiny bladders hence the name which act as suction traps for small invertebrates and I've got a 
better photo. This is actually a different species of bladderwort, but the traps are rather similar. So these are just a few millimetres across. So they work on a, a trapdoor mechanism. So whenever a small, very tiny aquatic creatures trigger the trapdoor, they tend to get sucked in, in probably something like one hundredth of a second. Um, so quite a unique type of carnivorous plant. And so I don't, I don't quite know actually why it's so rare in Herefordshire because at Mockers Park where it occurs, you can get quite a lot of it. It does grow very well, except it just doesn't seem to spread anywhere else. <clears throat> then I was just going to have a look at a few of the, kind of the marginal plants who tend to get around the drier parts of the pond. So yellow flag iris, I think you'd probably be, mostly be familiar with this. And as who was saying, Ian was saying, was Ian, you, yeah, this isn't isn't one you should eat. So, uh, so uh, slight warning there. <clears throat> and then these uh, bulrushes or reed maces, which is the name I prefer actually. Um, <clears throat> it tends just one of the species that's actually quite increasing, but it tends to does very well where nutrient levels are quite high. So it's often a not exactly a sign of pollution, but with ponds becoming increasingly subject to fertilizer runoff, it's one of the species that tends to dominate. And if left, left unchecked, will often rather grow completely over a pond. Um, so it's quite a distinctive species with these seed heads that you can see for quite a bit of the year. And then branched burr reed, this is another very um, very common are these marginal plant species. The leaves are kind of folded or sort of pleated almost in the middle so it's quite somewhat similar to the irises but quite distinctive once you get to recognize it. And if it's in flower it's a very easy one to recognize because it's got these sort of striking burr type fruits and again a very branched flower stem so it's quite a distinctive species and very very common around the pond margins and rivers and other water bodies. And sedges, so I'm not going to go into any detail on sedges really but I thought I should put one in for completeness. So this is Carex nigra, one of the fairly common species. These distinctive fruits, the fruits are quite flattened in this species and obviously like all sedges the le leaves tend to be in three ranks around the stem. So stems are normally triangular, I don't think that really comes across. And float grass, you've probably seen this photo before I think in the training course. So again this is uh, one of the aquatic grasses, it's about four different species in this genus, all fairly similar. And one of the plants that I think provides probably the some of the best habitat for aquatic invertebrates and also for amphibians. So it's a plant that's very popular with great crystal newts for egg laying. So the leaves seem just about the right size and consistency for that. So this where you see this habitat with shallow water and this submerged or semi-submerged grass you know that's normally going to be a very rich part of the pond for uh, invertebrates and other species. So any kind of pond dipping you might be doing that's normally these are normally the kind of areas you want to focus on. So really you want to be netting mostly in these sort of areas rather than in say very open water where you don't don't get nearly as much. So <clears throat> and then this is a one of the seasonal ponds at Cannon Bridge. It's got rather neglected and it's getting scrubbed over with this uh, crack willow. But the main point of this was that you can often get some quite rare and unusual plants in ponds which at first glance don't look particularly exciting necessarily. You can see it's a lot of willow and a lot of grass mainly in the centre. Um, <clears throat> what it does have this, a lot, of, a lot of grass there is actually this species which is orange foxtail which is quite uncommon in the county and quite an, a, quite an attractive grass. So I think I have a yeah, more 
close-up photo. So it's got these very bright orange anthers. And it's actually a, it's a related species, the marsh foxtail, which is very similar. It's a much commoner species, but the again, the orange foxtail is quite quite distinctive and does tend to it'll often grow quite out into the water and then tends to flower once the pond uh, dries up later in the year. Oh, this was mentioned earlier, the hemlock water dropworts. This is, I think this is around March when this photo was taken, so it's leaves just emerging, so it's one of the umbellifers. So these uh, very divided leaves, but a highly, highly toxic plant, especially the roots, which are very occasionally mistaken for celery and and eaten. So it tends to be fatal often. And this is the same species in flower later uh, later in the summer. So these very quite large white umbels of flowers. So quite distinctive. And <clears throat> this is one of its rarer relatives, the tubular water dropwort. So this is a much smaller, uh, much less conspicuous plant. This is a rather weedy example grown at the, tend to get them in the, sort of around the muddy margin of ponds. This I think is a somewhat better photo of the same species. So in these stems, you can see the stems are quite, they're tubular and hollow, so they're quite distinctive looking really, but it's not one of the most conspicuous plants. Also, we've got a few flowers of the spike rush in front of it. Again, that's, that's the common spike rush, quite a distinctive species. It's in the sedge family. So, <clears throat> and then marsh ragwort. So this is one of the species you can sometimes get coming up on the, the bare ground where the water's receded in the summer and you tend to get a lot of species germinating on the exposed mud. So this is possibly one of the most uh, attractive of those, I think. So it's related to the common ragwort, but unlike that species, it's not a, a problematic weed. I think it's poisonous, but it's not really, not an issue in the same way as common ragwort can be. <clears throat> and then golden dock, again, another one that tends to come up as the ponds are drying out. So it's quite an uncommon species within Herefordshire. It's actually at a pond in Cannonbridge, very close to the pond with the orange foxtail. And so quite a distinctive, distinctive looking dock. I don't have a close up of the fruits, but they, they uh, they're sort of toothed, rather different to the, the commoner, commoner species. So we actually didn't find this plant a couple of years ago when we resurveyed the ponds there, but it's one that might well come up again from the seed bank, just probably depends on the on the weather conditions each year, how well it does. And water purslane is quite a nice little plant. It's rather inconspicuous plant, tends to grow in the sort of trampled mud around the pond edges. So it's one to look out for, but it's e e quite easily, easily overlooked. And then greater spearwort, this it's the species actually, it's quite common in gardens and garden ponds, but it's much less common in the wild. So it's, it's possibly one that tends to escape somewhat from ponds as well, from garden ponds. But it's one of the, uh, it's essentially one of the aquatic buttercups. So you can see it's got very regular buttercup type flowers and these quite linear leaves. So, and then surrounding that, there's a lot more of the spike rush again. <clears throat> So, and then, unfortunately, I didn't have a photo of the flowers of the lesser spearwort, which is very similar to the previous one, but it's a much weedier, sort of weedier plant. Again, yellow buttercup type flowers, but smaller than the previous one. So, but what you might see this time of year are the basal leaves. So, they're quite a distinctive shape and quite different in appearance to the plant later in the year, so I wanted to include those. 
So certainly this time of year, there's something you might see quite commonly, and it's not always apparent what they are. So you wouldn't immediately look at those and think that was a species of buttercup. <clears throat> and then staying with the buttercups, actually, this this is the it's actually the subgenus Petrachium. So these are the aquatic buttercups. They all have white flowers, and so these are the water crowfoots, which have these generally have these very divided underwater leaves. <clears throat> But then later in the year, when the ponds dry out or when the leaves reach the surface, they tend to switch to more the like the leaf you can see on the right hand side, which is more well less divided and rather more of a flatter typical type leaf. And that's also when the plants tend to flower. So <clears throat> yeah, this rather unexciting looking puddle is really put in just to illustrate that you can get some quite nice plants sometimes in quite unexpected places. So this was really a puddle near a field gateway. So it's a very trampled, poached area, but there's quite a nice plant growing actually in it, which is the, you can see down the bottom here, it's the ivy-leaved crowfoot. So related to the previous plant, but instead of being a true aquatic really, it's a species you tend to get more, more in the mud. So <clears throat> Again, these so it, it doesn't it doesn't have the divided underwater leaves. This species only has these the flat kind of aerial or floating leaves, and which is bit, just to illustrate a bit more what it's like. This is one of its, its close relatives, the round leaf crowfoot, which also tends to grow on the exposed mud. Again, these flatter leaves, none of the divided underwater leaves, and you can see the fruits and the flower as well. So I don't, this species I don't think is very common in Herefordshire. Uh, then bog bean, again, I think it's not common in Herefordshire, quite a distinctive plant. So leaves face similar to the broad bean with these three leaflets, and it tends to form these rather large floating mats over the water, as you can illustrate this pond. So this is a pond at Rushuk. One of the, another kettle hole pond. So, and you can see the brown area in the centre of the pond. If we go a bit closer, it's, this is actually a very large mat of pretty much all bog bean. So you can see there's a fringe of live leaves at the water's edge, and the rest of it is um, not sure actually why it's all kind of dead looking like that, but. <clears throat> You can see the sort of dense mats it can form, just sort of growing out, floating over the water. And then duckweed. I thought I'd just put this in because it illustrates the two species of duckweed which we get most commonly in the county. So mostly on the right hand side with the larger leaves, you've got the common duckweed. It's our native, one of our native species. It tends to be more of a lighter green colour. And then on the left here with these very small leaves, the least duckweed, which is actually an alien species. I think it's from the Americas. It's now very, very common. So these leaves, they tend to be darker, more of a blackish green colour. So you can, you can distinguish them by the colour quite easily, especially in the summer when they're growing well. And the least duckweed tends to be more shade tolerant. So you often get it on very shaded ponds or woodland ponds where just just like common duckweed it can form these very large mats over the water but two species very similar ecologically but there is I think there is a difference in, in the shade tolerance particularly but <clears throat> this isn't actually one we've been asking people to record as one of the invasive aliens although actually it's probably the commonest non-native pond plant in the county uh, partly because of the difficulty in identification and partly because it's so widespread it really doesn't doesn't matter particularly there's not nothing you can do to remove it even if you wanted to um, <clears throat> and this is essentially a pond very close to that pond I showed at the start at uh, Staunton on Arrow so 
One of the reasons I put this in was just to demonstrate how often the richest ponds tend to have quite a kind of a layered appearance in the vegetation. So you can see you've got these emergent bulrushes here and then in between the floating pondweed, which I think this is all bog pondweed, which is the less one of the less common species. And then underneath that you'll have various um, Base of the submerged aquatics growing as well. So there's a lot, there's more than perhaps is immediately apparent. And then marginals like the soft, soft rush on the right. And so this is the commoner, commoner pondweed species, this is broadleaf pondweed. So quite a widespread common species. And uh, leaves quite distinctive in that they have a bit of a, a sort of a hinge at the base where the stalk meets the actual leaf blade. So they they float, they float very flat on the surface. And there's actually a, there's a particular species of moth, the brown China mark moth, which the caterpillar feeds on this species. I don't know if you can see any in the photo here, but the caterpillars tend to make, they cut themselves a small, small segment of leaf tract as a little case. And then they float around the pond within this protective case, just munching on the leaves like any, any other caterpillar. And I'm not sure if you can see, there's a few, the flowers of this, these pondweeds tend to stick up above the water surface, but they're rather, rather inconspicuous. <clears throat> and then finally on the floating plants, we've got, just to distinguish really, this is one of the non-native hybrid water lilies, often pink flowered, and not doing this massively, but they tend, you often get the leaves rather mounding up to form very, very large sort of mats above the water surface. So that's one to, ones to look out for. And then finally, really, this is the native white water lily, which you don't tend to see very often, but doesn't normally, I don't think it tends to mound up the leaves in the same way. So tend to be a bit more, uh, spread out and just close up of the flower. So <clears throat> that's about, I think that's about it really. Uh, it's just, it just a brief introduction really to some of the pond plants. That's great. Thank you, Miles. It's a really nice whistle stop tour through the most of the plants that you're likely to see when we're out surveying, I think. That was, that was really good. Thanks. Love super photos as well. Um, has anybody got any questions for Giles? I've got one, actually, um, to start with. Um, the, the, the foxtails, orange foxtail and marsh foxtail, when I presume the, uh, when the orange foxtail isn't flowering and that, that orangey, the anthers have gone, is it, is it easy to tell that one from the marsh foxtail? Um... That's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm sure there probably is a difference, but certainly... But the likes of me probably wouldn't, wouldn't be able to tell. Yes, I didn't put... I, had, I did take actually a comparison photo, which I didn't include in the talk. Um, but one of the... There are quite there are several differences in, in the actual... in the flowers. If you, so if you see them flowering, they're quite straightforward to distinguish. Mm. Um, a ruler can be helpful actually because the anthers in the orange foxtail are quite small and they are properly orange whereas the I'll see if I can actually get the so you need, I'll be able to get my comparison photo up if you give me a minute yeah. um, just to say for anyone yep. out there you don't have to be able to identify no, these of course it's not, nice if you can uh, just out of interest. You definitely don't have to be able to just <laughs> yeah. to reassure anyone Great if you can do it, but you don't need to. Uh, On the other hand, I just learned there's a caterpillar that builds boats. That's fantastic, so isn't it? I feel that's one. made my day. Mm. <laughs> Where is it? Right, then we, perhaps we should get somebody to come in and talk to us a bit more it's the, about some of the specifics of these. Well, Will's doing um, pond invertebrates next week, aren't you, Will? Mm. So maybe yeah, there'll be a few. Yeah, we, we, we may share it, uh, Giles and I. Oh, yes. Because yeah. that's equal, isn't it? So we, we yeah. and we've done a equal shares. Yeah. It might be quite nice oh, to have both of us. 
It'd be really helpful to have some suggestions for field identification guides so that we don't have to pick them to bring them home to, um, to work out what, what we're seeing. Well, we, we will we be providing the... Provide them uh, in your volunteer kits, but I will see if I can find some detailed ones that might help you for the less likely to see ones, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, no, it'd be, it would be very helpful. Um, otherwise, if we could ha even have a copy of the slides would be brilliant. Yeah. Just to print out for ourselves as a sort of little handout in the field. We were going to have the um, the field studies guide leaflet to, to pond plants available in the kit, right. so that that'll be that'll be the very basics. But they're quite useful for for this level of surveying anyway. But any if, you, if anybody wants to go into any more detail, then we can obviously um, uh, recommend other books. Also, you can take pictures and email them, Giles. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. I mean, the talk wasn't really yeah. aimed at a sort of identification type level, really. It was just no. a bit of an overview. So, yeah. And if you send exciting ones, I have a sneaking suspicion Giles will be uh, emailing back going, exactly which pond were you at? I need to visit. This is an exciting new find. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is the, that's the mm. book that I use that's rose is it yeah yeah the wildflower key yeah that's sort of standard for all that's got all uh, terrestrial plants and everything up that and trees and everything there isn't it yeah there are, there are smaller versions that, that just concentrate on pond and wetland plants which might we'll be send quite... out the details of that yeah. in yeah. an email so that you don't have to quickly jot it down Giles has lots of amazing photos, which I imagine is why he's hunting for the right one. Yeah, I can't find the one I was looking for. It's, I'm not quite sure where I've got it, to be honest. Don't um, worry about it, Giles. It's oh, any... yeah, no. Uh, My pictures tend to be pictures of rocks with hammers. It, it's not the same. If I do find it, I'll put it up. But in the meantime, we better carry on, really. Celine has put an interesting comment up. She, she, she had to play with the Seek app during your presentation by pointing it at the photos on the screen. Oh. It was about 70% successful at species level and slightly higher at genus level, in case oh. this is useful. That's, that, that's useful to know, actually, yeah. That's assuming, assuming I've got them all right. <laughs> so you have. Yeah. Um, okay, if there, if there are no more, well, but by all means, uh, mm. put some more questions on the chat if you if you have, if they spring to mind on the, on the in, during the, the morning um what i thought i'd do for a bit of light light relief for if it's not it's a very short one but giles if you'd like to stop sharing yours oh you have um oh, okay. i'll just just show you the uh the the short film that guys have put together of the mockers park training day so hold fire Ice Age Ponds project is at Mockers Park today. It's a National Nature Reserve and SSSI, full of some really interesting Ice Age Ponds, as well as a huge variety of veteran trees. It's a fabulous place. We're um, training our volunteers how to survey ponds. Well, we've been trying out the techniques of filling in the form, um, on the survey form, um, various aspects of it, the geomorphological aspects, the aquatic life aspects as well. Say so you get underneath the where your ball like caps it's off the edge. And some of the invertebrates, they, they're right at the side. Unfortunately, we're going to get a lot of leaves, but I sometimes do that. That gets a few beetles usually. And rinse it or something.
Wasn't that good? <laughs> so that's it's just, they're designed for um, to go up on internet on um, Twitter and Facebook and things like that. So just to raise the profile. Thank you to okay. those who came out. Yeah. Um, especially those who were breaking ice on the Sunday morning. <laughs> it was nippy. Yeah. Um, that, those first few people on Sunday, and um, the. Should I tell them about the follow-up, Dave? Yeah. Uh, so we know that there are a few people who weren't able to come out with us that weekend. So we'll be sending out details of some dates where, for those who haven't had the training, uh, can come out and have the training again. But we also know that it was definitely an intense 45 minute session with each of us. Um, so we're going to offer um, a couple of dates where you book your arrival time and then you come and you fill the form in and there'll be someone on hand to help double check that you know what you're doing, answer any questions you have. But you'll get a chance to really work through and actually complete the form from start to finish and just make sure that you do feel comfortable doing that. Um, obviously, no one has to do it. I know for the volunteers who've already had the training and were doing this in 2019, um, they might be raring to go. Um, but if anyone does want to come out and do it, we'll send out the dates and you're only booking your arrival time so that we don't get a car park full of people at bang on the start time. But you can stay uh, much longer, as long as you need to stay, to feel that you're happy completing the forms. So we'll be sending out the dates for those. And again, you'll get your big kit in the car park and trundle over and have a pond and uh, just stride out uh, or not, depending on how big your paces are. Um, and uh, yeah, just have a go filling in the forms to make sure that you do feel confident that you're able to do it. And then I know Dave will tell you about going out and doing it. That was the next thing to do. Um, thanks to a huge amount of work that's been done by uh, both Beth and Ian and Sarah and, and well, everybody collecting the data. But in, the, in recent weeks, all that data has been put together, put into a spreadsheet um, of this is all the walking surveys as well as the, the last year's or the year before surveys. So a huge spreadsheet. Um, and Beth and Ian have gone through it, I, um, trying to whittle down those that are on the right geology. So if they're on the on the, the, uh, the hammocky moraine, so that there is a chance if they're a pond there that they might be an ice age pond and they might be a kettle hole. Um, so we had a session yesterday where Ian had his GIS, which had all this data pumped into it. And it was almost like the fog lifting for me because we had a map showing the position of all the ponds that we'd surveyed and those that had been surveyed in as part of the walking survey. And we had really good coverage of, of areas where we hadn't, of the hummocky moraine, particularly in the middle of the county, um, uh, around the um, Webley area, where we haven't done any surveys before, but there's lots of ponds scattered around. And we targeted those areas where we've, not visited before, so the, the central centre of the county, as well as the northeast of the county, and and several other areas. And we, I think, we honed it down to a short list of about forty. Was it, Giles? That by we had forty. We had forty-seven so far. Yeah. So there's forty-seven, and I'm no doubt when we start going out, finding landowners, or finding out who owns them, they will as happened two years or two seasons ago, we were then, they then said, oh, there's another one over there, go and do that. So we'll probably end up with, with two or three more from each, from each pond on occasions. So there'll be more that, that, that uh, arise from that in a sort of organic way. So we're well into the way. And so that means that once we've identified um, the owners and got permissions, and, and some of you may be able to help us with that, um, we can actually start going out when, when um, restrictions allow, um, with with the uh, with the kit that um, that Beth mentioned earlier on, and um, start start getting some surveys done. So it's a quite a, quite an exciting time, really. Anything else to add to that, Beth? Well, I, fa or Ian? I, fa I found my photo. I could. Uh, uh, oh yeah, call cool, him. Does that come up? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's the two speed. That's the on the right. That's the orange foxtail, so right. bright orange anthers, and they. It's hard to see, but they're actually quite. They're smaller than on the, the. Uh, so on the left is the marsh foxtail, 
Right. The whole flower spike is longer on the Marshall Foxtail. It's wider. And if you see right at the top, it's got these thorns or the, the little spikes sticking out of the flowers. Yeah. Um, so on the orange foxtail, these horns are very, very short and they barely stick out of the flower at all. Yeah. Whereas the marsh foxtail, the horns are very visible. So that's right. And the anthers, I think the anthers are normally purple, but they, as they age, they go a sort of brown color, but they're not kind of bright orange as you go mm. orange foxtail. Mm. So those are the, those are the, the orange foxtail, the panicle looks a bit more parallel and cylindrical than the, the sort of it's point, very less pointy. Sort of it's very parallel side, isn't it? This is yeah. yeah, it is a bit more elliptical almost. Um, yeah. I haven't. I think I've got a photo of the base. I'm not sure actually, but um, they're the distinctive grass, isn't that? They the stems are kind of bent. They often tend to start going out sideways, and they'll they'll gradually curve up towards the end. I wonder. I wonder if you had a sort of crib sheet that you know was printed out with you know, a few labels, whether people might be able to go out in the field and spot those I differences. I think they might, but I'm but, reiterating, yes. you don't have to be able to do this. No, Not for our surveys. Is, I think, Great if you're interested. Well, if anyone wants to, that is. Oh, yeah, yeah. if they want to. Because yeah. yeah. the same would apply to, mo to many of the species that Giles showed. There are, he showed one species, that, but in most of those cases, there are two or three other species which look, very similar, particularly the, the crowfoots and the, yep. the, the, um, the uh, um, maybe I was thinking for myself, pondweeds. No, I, th I, th I think it's good to encourage if people do want to go into that sort of detail, then we should encourage them to do so. So, yeah, good. I don't want to frighten any geologists. I would be terrified trying to identify those two plants. <laughs> but maybe that's just me. I'm much well, more no, into my rocks. As you say, it's not it's not required for this for these surveys. So um okay, well, um that's more or less it for this morning. Um so next week we have Will and Giles um on pond invertebrates, which I'm really looking forward to. That should be very interesting. No doubt we'll have some some really detailed stuff there but we must remember that we don't need all of the detail but it will be extremely interesting to find out a bit more about about the things that we might find and indeed it might hopefully it will inspire people to to get a bit more into into the uh, the subject as well um, just to note barbara's put a comment up she uses the plant net app oh, for wonderful. identifying plants i will send these out in an email with the details of next week so that you don't have to suddenly try and remember them but she said that she's found that one to be useful. Thanks, Barbara. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, yeah. So, any anybody else? Any other comments or anything to say? No, just to say as a volunteer, how much I enjoyed last the other weekend in the Deer Park. It was brilliant. It was lovely, wasn't it? Thanks. Well, thanks for coming. It's, I think we all enjoyed. It. it was very hard work for for Will and Beth and Giles. I quite enjoy. <laughs> I yeah, just... they were on their feet all day long. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. yes, yes, it was a long day. Yes, yeah. I do remember that. It was a long weekend, but I've seen more people that weekend than I have yeah. in probably the last year. It, it was, was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Really enjoyable. Yeah. So yeah. thanks very much for everyone coming out. And as I say, we'll be sending out the dates next week that you can come out and do a longer session. And for those who weren't able to join us, um, hopefully you might be able to join us for the training. We will keep offering dates. So even if you if you can't make those, do pester us. We will try and put something forward for those if you need a different type of day, like you can't make that day. So do keep trying. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the field again, really out there. It's much more fun. Yes. So um, as I say, next week, it's Will and Giles doing Pond Invertebrates. And the week after, and please, I'm... I think it's Ian doing the geology of... No, the week, the, Ian's doing the geology the week after that. The week after so, is us telling you about ponds you can visit and hopefully so, persuading you to sign up and choose where you want to go. Excellent. Thank you, Beth. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Nice to see you. We'll see you soon. Bye, pond.